wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Space Monkeys, blasting off with over 70 interviews that have gone off without a hitch. Well, except that one with Dom that we had to reshoot because I didn't press record on the audio. But when I finally get to speak to the smart, charming, sharp, objectively handsome Sean Tabrese, we have a technical nightmare. Camera battery's failing. Is it a power thing or? Microphone plugged into the wrong jack. Hair completely askew. There are apparently limits to how many interviews I can record in a single day. Which makes it all the more impressive to understand how Sean juggles all he does at parody. I begin by asking him if there's a definition for what he does. There is a title for my role. Um, I am one of the engineering team leads uh, for a few different teams, actually. The Frame Team, which is the team that builds this um, really nice language for building like runtimes. Basically, most of the applications built on Substrate are built using Frame. I also lead this team. It's a little bit less concrete. It's called Onboard the World. And it's more of this initiative of trying to get products which have really defined end-to-end -end user stories for individuals out there. The last, the last team is um, the documentation team. And it's actually where I kind of started. When I um, first joined Parity, you know, I really didn't know that much about um, blockchain on an engineering level. You know, I was never actually a Rust developer um, before joining Parity. So I needed some time to onboard and to learn about the space and stuff. And actually, I spent my early days doing uh, documentation for Parity. Um, writing tutorials, doing developer advocacy, all that kind of stuff. So how do we onboard the world? This is one of those things that came from Gav. And Gav has a lot of really crazy ideas. I mean, we're here right now, um, right after having been like one month, I've been teaching students in Cambridge, the Polkadot Blockchain Academy. This was an idea that just pops up in Gav's head. Like, we need this. And Gav at some point kind of tapped me and said, hey, like there are some specific areas in where, you know, we can make direct impact to show value to Polkadot to the average user. The, not, not the, I mean, Polkadot already has a lot of value for hardcore developers, people who want to build blockchains. But what about the end consumer, the person right. who wants to like own Dot and, you know, is not going to write code, but is going to understand they're part of some bigger mission, right? Yes. And so Onboard the World is exactly about that. It's about like, okay, let's identify what kinds of groups there are out there. Maybe not the ones that Polkadot is even best at suiting, but at least giving the, give them enough to feel comfortable to be in the space. That like, hey, they actually are hearing me and listening to me. I think this team has identified a few different initiatives, staking, governance. NFTs and assets, even things like identity, like I mean, integrating um, Web2 identities with Web3 identities, even like um, the simple um, gifting of assets. Another, another thing you might have seen on one of the decoded was this thing called the, the gifts, right? And, and actually most of the um, like NFTs we give out in Polkadot community go through this gifts portal. And this is one of the initiatives we got to, like how can we make it so that someone who doesn't have an account can still get um, you know, some token, some dot, some NFT, um, in real time, in a, in, a, in a safe way, in a, in a decentralized way. And yes. that's where the, the gift situation came up. So really, it's a, it's, it's a team of people that I've hired. They're all senior level. Um, I kind of give them a spark an idea in their head, and they can roll with it. And I can just kind of send each check that they're going the right direction. How many teams does he have working with him right now? So that's uh, three teams. Yeah. I think I have like 14 reports, okay. which is a lot. But um, you know what's fortunate is actually um, I select wisely around my reports. I, I try to stick very close to them in the first couple of months, try to make sure that they are successful and they can, you know, achieve. Yeah. But kind of as quickly as possible, I want them to spread their own wings and have their own direction, right? Absolutely. And at that point, it's just sanity checking, you know? It's just like saying like, hey, like, you know, are you enjoying the work you're doing? And do you think that you're going the right direction? And, you know, just, um, I don't want to steer the ship for everyone. I just want to give them the direction. How did he get involved with Parity in the first place? I was at Microsoft before that. Okay. I was working on identity systems. And actually, I ran into um, Ethereum, as a solution to some of the identity problems that we're trying to solve in the Web2 world, right? right? So at Microsoft, you know, they are worried about like, you know, all these accounts getting compromised. They are worried about like, you know, emails um, and other personal information getting out there. Yeah. And this idea of self-sovereign identity has been something that's been around for a long time. And so at uh, Microsoft, when looking at like, what are the solutions today? This thing called Ethereum popped up. It's like, hey, this is actually a way you might be able to implement some of these self-sovereign identity systems, right? Very interesting for me. Um, but that, you know, I think with most people that I've talked to in this space, there's something which they, it bites you about crypto and then you fall in deep. You just go like, I don't know, just every day you just learn more and you're more amazed and you're kind of unsure if it's real, but then it is real. And then you, like, you can't like, 
It's one of the things you're just waiting for that one paper you read that says like, haha, just kidding, all this is bullshit. But everything is just kind of builds off of these primitives, which we know work for a long time. I kind of at some point decided, okay, I need to leave Microsoft. I need to be part of a Web3 startup. Um, but at the time, there was a lot of ICO. This is like 2017. There was um, a lot of ICOs. Like that was the ICO boom, right, happening there. A lot of kind of application level stuff. But I was personally interested in the lower level, the actual core blockchain technology itself. How will we make this thing that scales and is untoppable and is like you know powerful? And so when looking around, um, I was also reading Mastering Ethereum, which was co-authored by Gavin Wood. I kind of said, hey, who was this Gav guy doing? Oh, he has this company called Parity. I didn't, I knew the word parity because I knew about parity Ethereum. It was the fastest Ethereum client at the time, but I never thought about parity being a company. I thought it was just might just be a name of something. But then he has this company. I knew this product. I started investigating and be like, wow, this team is really awesome. It's a small engineering team, all hardcore Rust developers, all building like core blockchain tech. I need to be there. So I basically applied. I applied actually as a, as a technical support. And I said I applied for it, and I think I was way overqualified, but I'm glad they let me in and, you know, just kind of grew from there. What did Polkadot look at that time, I wondered? I wanted to join the Ethereum team. It was only during, right when I joined, where Gav is kind of like, hey, actually, there's a substrate thing that we're doing. It might be more exciting for you, especially if you want to learn about the more, like, low-level blockchain stuff. This is where more innovation is going to be happening, right? And so I, had, I always had a choice at the time. Do I stick with the Parity Ethereum team? And they were doing some kind of maintenance and some other stuff, you know, for... Um, Ethereum or I joined the Substrate team. And I think, luckily, I went to Substrate and I had been working on Substrate since basically day one. Now, there was always the idea of Polkadot. If you don't remember the history that um, the Polkadot repo came first and they renamed it to Substrate and then they made a Polkadot repo separate. That's part of the history. But so Polkadot's always been there, but I myself never even really touched Polkadot until maybe a year into my job. It was just Substrate at the time. It was just building this general blockchain framework. We didn't actually start thinking about Polkadot as a specific kind of blockchain until we got past the like substrate being kind of usable. So he's been there from the beginning, but how far along does he think we are to mission accomplished? Yeah, mission accomplished is definitely not the, not the word. Um, the, actually, in fact, I almost feel like mission is starting now. Like the primitives are just forming to make that happen. I mean, yeah. um, if we were to have a parachain summit two years ago, it would probably be like just three people, right? We have like 30 people here, like all building, all representing five to 10 people engineering teams all building hardcore layer one applications on our platform, right? So this is just the beginning, right? I think that Substrate has gotten to a form of stability, which we haven't seen yet. And this stability leads towards um, allowing more users to feel comfortable going to the ecosystem. I know in the past we've had some issues where people have tried to use Substrate and said things are kind of still too moving too quickly. So um, I'm not sure if I can actually um, dedicate my engineering team to build on this because my plan is to launch in one year. Two years ago, if, I, if someone asked me that, I'd probably say Substrate isn't for you. But today, if someone says, I want to launch in one year, Substrate actually is that. It is there. So I think we are just starting to hit the surface of it. And I think now with the kind of feedback we get in this room, um, we will be able to direct ourselves uh, much more uh, concretely on what we want Substrate to do. I want to help identify what are the places that users interact with most in Substrate how can we make those things polished and clean? Yeah. And all the things that they don't look at work as fast as possible. What does he mean by users exactly? Are these the builders or the people who use what the builders create? We had the exercise at one point to like create our customer stories, like who are all our customers? Yeah. And there were like 10 of them. Because okay. it really is, it's a wide range. I can, I can name a few. It's not just development. You have runtime development. You have core development, which is like more the blockchain stuff. You have contract development. You have front end development. And they're all using different languages, right? Ink versus um, like Rust frame versus Rust Rust versus um, uh, JavaScript TypeScript. So that's already four narratives. And I just talked about engineering. Now we talk about there are um, CTOs who themselves are trying to make decisions. What platform do I build on? I'm going to be launching a company. It's going to be like a billion dollar company. Right. Who do I make that bet on? Because once I make a bet, it's hard to like switch technologies later, right? Then you have the actual developers themselves who um, they need to actually know how to use these tools and how it works and stuff like that. And then you have marketing. Then you have the average consumer who's just a dot holder. You have someone who's an investor, a speculator. You have someone who's in um, you know, third world countries trying to use these things to empower themselves to accomplish things. Like The two people that I'm most concerned about yeah. are this. The actual engineers who are actually writing the code, making sure that they can be successful on our platform and, they are, and we're not limiting them in any way. Yeah. Second is the adopters. The, and again, you go to a lot of conferences, I assume. Not everyone at a conference is there to be a builder, but they're there to learn and to like spread the word. And that's the second, the second audience. And what I want to make sure is that their curiosity is satisfied. I want them to 
it's the same thing as me, not feel a doubt of, oh, I just didn't read the one paper which says this is all bullshit. I want to say, no, it is real. This is real. I can explain it to you. You can explain it to yourself. You can explain it to others on the simple terms. How exactly it works, that's very hard. But why and the kind of general idea, that's what I'm interested in. So it's, it's at two levels. What does he see as Parity's role in the development of Polkadot going forward? It is true that today and for the last four years that Polkadot has been entirely driven by Parity. Some company needs to build these things. Some company needs to put the investment and the time to do that. It cannot be that um, over time things only get more centralized or more powerful. Right. It's, it's, that, it's that idea of seeding from the beginning, even though we are the kind of the sole gatekeepers today, that our intention is to let it free and to find the right time. One of the things that uh, we were all concerned about at Parity is that as soon as we, we open the floodgates, like, hey, everyone, give us your ideas, then the direction of Polkadot can go every way, right? Like, because, for example, if we were just to ask people out there in blockchain space today, what do you want us to build? They would say, we want the fastest DeFi platform. But that's, that's not what Web3 is at all. I'm consistently worried the narrative around the blockchain space is, again, Bitcoin, not blockchain. DeFi, not Web3. Like, the, like, we're going too close to, like, these are the things that we know work versus investigating this bigger mission. And so I think the centralization you're seeing with Polkadot is to ensure that we don't get trapped down one of these, like, niche gates. We are not, like, a um, NFT-optimized blockchain. We are not a DeFi-optimized blockchain. In fact, we probably won't do DeFi on Polkadot Relay Chain better than other chains, right? But what we are is a platform for, for any kind of Web3 solution to build best on top of, right? And so we are, for example, really, really um, concerned about ensuring that um, these common good parachains, things like identity solutions, things like per proof, of, proof of personhood, things like um, privacy layers, that those kinds of companies don't need to compete with DeFi to work. And that's what the entire leasing model of Polkadot comes down to. It's like, hey, you don't have to do a pay per transaction method. You can actually come onto the Polkadot ecosystem as a parachain and pay zero dollars. We can onboard you through governance and you can get, you know, $20 billion of security against your chain that's providing, you know, good, uh, common good needs to humans, right? Yeah. That's the goal. And once, I think we're at a point now where people are seeing that, that there are enough parachain teams that are diversified across different aspects. That's where we start saying, okay, now you can, now you let us go. Now we're take, you know, take the wheel. But um, I think the only way we could have gotten to this point is with a little bit of strong guidance. Does Sean think about governance a lot? I think that um, DAOs are the next thing, right? It was, it was ICOs, then it was DeFi, then it was NFTs. I think DAOs are the next thing. I think that the ability for people to come together and make decisions in deterministic ways, in these anonymous ways, on these on-chain governances yeah. is extremely exciting. I think that, uh, again, we've seen a lot of interesting use cases in DeFi, like people have created these like um, funds, right, where everyone can make decisions on what NFTs to buy or what things to buy, but I'm thinking more about how those, we can make decisions about like um, the direction of how we develop and what we do and stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure you heard about fellowship, I'm sure you heard about governance v2. This is the kind of stuff that actually Polkadot does better than anyone else. And I've been working on the old governance. I've been working on, um, I helped build a society palette. So the society palette is an application built on Kusama, which somehow reaches its arm out and convinces humans to get a tattoo on their body, spreading the word of Kusama. Once we have a set of people who are enough passionate to put a permanent scar on their body yeah. that about some, about some uh, blockchain, yeah. imagine the kind of, um, advocacy they can bring. Imagine the kind of stories they can tell. Imagine the kind of things they can do together and actually reach out to the real world. Like people who are excited enough to go out there and put something on their body, they, they might be excited enough to put um, the same tattoo as on a billboard in Times Square or in the middle of um, you know, Shibuya or anything, right? There are, there are so many um, keyboard warriors out there who they are big talkers, but don't do anything. You have to go out there and do something. Yeah. That's what we wanted to see. And this is like, um, this is how blockchains can start seeding these outer infrastructures, these outer societies, and, and, and make impact to the world. If we're just making people rich, I'm not gonna be in it. If we can actually change the world, change the governance structures that are out there today, the things that are you know leading our lives, yeah. that's when we actually succeed. That's when I say mission accomplished. So we have a quarter billion dollars locked in our treasuries. We're about to dissolve the council on Kusama, and hand the keys over to the token holders themselves. What does he hope to see happen? I wanna see a lot more money spent yeah. on a lot more awesome projects. And specifically, I wanna see that follow up. I feel like we are finding interesting people and we are getting money to them. We could maybe do a little bit more efficiently. I think that's just a process problem. Maybe it's just a timing thing, but I don't feel like often enough I get that clear like 
like, you know, that win out there, like those videos being published with, you know, like we use this much treasury funding and we made this and like everyone knows about it and everyone's using those things. Make utilities that are online, which allow for the allocation of money more easily, the allocation of money more transparently, and it just, you know, really use that treasury. Because if we don't use it, it gets burnt. And that's the worst, the worst outcome. Is there a difference between the utility of the Polkadot and Kusama treasuries? I'll tell you this. Um, if someone went to the Polkadot treasury and said, hey, I wanted to throw a wild party about, you know, about Polkadot on some island or whatever, I would probably say no. I think Polkadot should be spending its money on more like normal conferences and normal stuff. Kusama, maybe I would say yes. Kusama, I would say, hey, that's the kind of the spirit of the thing. Like, you know, let's let's make a giant totem pole and, uh, you know, with a, with, a, with a canary at the top and, you know, let's, let's, let's run around it. That sounds like fun. But I think Kusama is really about more um, pushing interesting ideas that would otherwise not be seen as an obvious win. Whereas Polkadot is more like, let's bet on the real big things that we know concretely a lot. And just like Kusama is the Polkadot today, we try something out Kusama, it ends up working really well, then we, we bring it to Polkadot. So I think that uh, it's all about being, being able to say yes more on Kusama. What's Sean's advice to people who are just entering the ecosystem but want to contribute to its growth? The best way that they'll find the right projects is to, for them to remember where they're coming from or why this space exists to begin with. There are a lot of companies out there, a lot of blockchains out there who are pushing a narrative around what they think is good. And my understanding is that they're, they're only blockchain by name. They are mostly centralized, um, distributed uh, databases versus actual like, you know, distributed, um, decentralized, powerful Web3 systems. Then I think you would see um, that there's only a few companies out there who are really actually making innovation, innovation in that space. They're not just um, trying to create technology, which is speed for speed's sake, but actually create technologies which will survive and last. Now you're in the Polkadot space, there's a lot of things happening there. There's a lot of test networks, there's a lot of, um, you know, relay chain and parachain teams. Like, it's hard to identify what the scope of Polkadot is exactly, right? Find out what mission that you are most interested in, in that space. Like, what is the problem that you see in the world? My bet is that there is a parachain solving that problem. Whether it be identity, whether it be governance, whether it be DeFi, whether it be NFTs, whether it be empowering individuals, like there are an amazing wealth of different blockchains um, building on top of Polkadot are doing that. And I think that the best home for you is that home. Because to be honest, this is my honest opinion, and I don't know if this is great for Polkadot or not, but it is hard to take the average person and have them resonate with Polkadot, the technology. People love the internet. People love Reddit and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. They don't love UDP, HTTP, you know, HTTP like, you know, um, TCP, IP, all, like, all this stuff, right? They don't resonate with those technologies. That, unfortunately, is what Polkadot is, right? I think, as someone in, in going to space, find that parachain team that's doing what you really love yeah. and understand why Polkadot is enabling them to do it. Why they can be a five-person engineering team and build radical technologies that will last forever because something like Substrate exists, which, which has built most of the blockchain for that team already. Because Polkadot exists with its shared security, providing a, like an amazing economic system for them to build their thing on top of. Because we have things like crowd loans and governance and treasury to fund and, and help um, these people accomplish their goals. Polkadot is all of the things to make uh, these projects succeed. You should not necessarily be, as an individual investor, be backing Polkadot, but, pack, but back the thing which uses Polkadot to its best ability. Finally, if he had an extra lifetime to spare, what would he spend that time building? This is where I actually do know what I would want to do. Okay. And if you're interested, you can go and go to a website called synesthesia.network. And I, at some point in my fevered state, whatever, I wrote down a bunch of ideas. But the basic thing was, I think at Polkadot, we're constantly making... Um, compromises between UX and up and like what's optimal for the blockchain. Polkadot being such a low layer zero one thing, often we side with what's most efficient for the blockchain, not necessarily what's most efficient for the UX, right? Yeah. I think I would love to experiment what if, what would something like Polkadot look like or a blockchain look like if we just optimize UX from the beginning? I would want to see like if resource and bandwidth and blockchain didn't have this limit, how far could we push user experience so that it really is something that people feel natural to use? And so some of the ideas, I'll tell you some of the ideas from Synesthesia. Uh, one was a um, reputation system, like um, a reputation graph. I wanted a system where you can only be invited in. So it's not like you can just go on exchange and get a token. You'd actually have to be invited in, and by someone inviting you in, we're forming like a trust 
network between you and that individual. So that will create a lot of interesting structures where you can actually maybe put some kind of trust towards individuals versus um, you know having to assume everything is, has to be civil resistant. Beyond that, I wanted to adjust the account model. One of the things that we hear about in the blockchain space a lot is people losing their keys, right? And once you lose your keys, like all this data that you've built into this account, like let's say you bought a, uh, an ENS name, let's say you have all these NFTs that are soul bounded, right? You have all this stuff, it's stuck there and you can't really do anything with it. That account is compromised. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a two layer account model from the beginning where there's an, a, a keyless account, which, which holds all of your data. And then of course a proxy account, which you always use to access. Now, Polkadot supports stuff like this. We have proxies, we have things that make that. But I want to do that as a default, right? That you start in the ecosystem, you have this friendly account, which probably has a domain name, like something like Sean dot, you know, Sean Debrizi dot dot, whatever. This account would never itself accumulate any uh, information that isn't completely transferable. All of the actual data and accumulation would happen in this lower level. And if I ever lost my account, there could be social recovery systems to allow you to recover this bottom lace account with a new top level account that you actually have the keys for and that are secure. You can even imagine building some kind of key rotation system where every month or every year, we're constantly moving people over, doing best practices of like, you know, password reset, whatever. Yeah, beyond that, I would love to create um, uh, like social hierarchies. What if literally because you hold more token in this ecosystem, you have more rights to systems? Like for example, we right now are concerned building a governance system that's, that is civil resistant because we think that every dot holder should vote. That I think is a fair assessment. Yeah. But what if we just shift that and say, only if you have over um, 1,000 of this token, synesthesia token, can you actually vote in democracy? Given a total supply of let's say a million tokens, that means there's no more than 1,000 voters that are physically possible to vote in the system. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about a civil attack. I can actually design systems which are more um, complex because I have a economic limit to how attacked a system can be. So you can almost imagine you can create these ranks where basically even at a certain rank, you can get free transactions. If, if you need a million tokens to be able to get 10 free transactions per day, and we know there's a total supply of tokens, you know, you could basically give away free transactions to the top tier or top echelon users of your system. Right. So all of these things I think are systems which um, haven't been explored as much. I, and when I say you can't vote unless you have this much tokens, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, but it's an interesting thing to experiment yeah. with. I would want to investigate those kinds of interesting social hierarchies. So that's, that's, that's my thing. So if you, if you look at synesthesia.net, okay. I, um, I have some ideas there. Cool. Um, but yeah, that would be what I do. Well, one more thing actually. Yeah. Um, so Frame right now, that the team that I, I lead, is, is, is quite complex to allow for flexibility. But it's more complex than it needs to be for the most minimal case. I think that we could do better to make the 70% of people have an easier time. I would love to experiment with a new version of, of Frame. Um, I have uh, an idea of naming it Slither, because it would be called Sean's Super Simple Substrate System, which is like like a slither, like a, like a, the sound. And I would be interested again, like pushing that boundary. Let's not make a system which is flexible for everyone, but instead make a system that does um, way easier for the 70% of users. What does that look like? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that, that kind of stuff. Sean, it was great talking to you. Can't wait to talk to you soon. Thanks for everything you do and for coming here to share it on Space Monkeys. Thank you.